Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, for the last couple of years, I have been hosting a guest on my show, just about every show, except for once last year where we had an individual record me and then that show was put on. And so today's a little different is doing a solo show. And I hope by the end of this that this will be encouraging for you. I mean, a lot has gone on. I hate to, uh, I'll call it time stamp an episode because you could be listening to this three years after it's recorded. But 2020 has been a pretty interesting year, stressful for many of us, uh, and certainly not what we would have anticipated on New Year's Eve on 2019 going into 2020. So, but I hope that the information that I'm going to share with you today is timeless and that it's encouraging to you, that it's thoughtful towards you, that it's something that you can share with others this show, this episode. You know, many of you know who have been regular listeners is that my purpose in life is to help others to live, lead, and work on purpose. And that I've been working in this industry for 32 years. I've got 10,000 hours of coaching. I've presented 3,000 times as a paid presenter. Uh, Now published over 500 articles, written four books, co-author of 12 assessments. And who would have thought that for a kid that was dyslexic and told in his grade nine English class that he wouldn't amount to anything because I couldn't read or write and I couldn't spell. And so that really led to me being verbal in my interaction with the environment and really not writing much. I mean, there wasn't even computers and typewriters when I went to school. I'm not hopefully dating myself, but uh, at the same time grew into technology. Uh, When I did my MBA, learned really to type on the computer. And now everything that I write has to come through my fingertips on a keyboard. That is really how I think and how I write and how I develop. So here we are, all that content later, never ever even thinking that would be a possibility to be an author. But that be its may, this show is really about you, but also something new that we have recently launched. And again, if you're listening to this a year after record it, it was new when we come into 2021. But we have uh, launched our new e-course based on my book, The Quest for Purpose. And I haven't done a show on purpose directly for some time. And I really wanted to talk about that today with you. There are so many people struggling with direction. Now there are a lot of individuals trying to figure out what next, what direction, where do I go, who do I become, what I was doing is no longer relevant. There are just a lot of changes. So that being said, I want to take you through parts of the e-course, the quest for purpose. And so it's available for you to be able to go online, take it, you know, uh, on demand as you wish. But just a couple of things before we get ahead of this is that, you know, CRG now has uh, numerous online courses They're all available to view on crgleader.com and just look under the CRG Academy or the online courses tab. You know, we have a course for our personal style indicator or, you know, why aren't you more like me or our values? Why, what do you really value? Our, our wellness course, which is based on our stress indicator and health planner dying to live. Of course, the, uh, the quest for purpose, Um, you know, you know, why don't you sell the way that I buy? Why don't you teach the way that I learn transforming leadership? all courses that are up or will be up uh, shortly. And it's interesting, you know, he, as a small firm, now this is our 41st year as a company, so I've been around for a long time, is that we were rated one of the top three providers of leadership development on the globe, on, in the planet, on the planet, uh, in competing and beating out people like uh, Disney University. So it's just sort of a proud heritage to be able to serve at that level. And then our three-day certification has been rated one of the top 10 certifications globally as well. So when we're developing the e-course, I really wanted to take the book, and we've now converted it into a journal. So now somebody could go, and if you, you can order it online as a digital PDF with a form fill 
capabilities. So all the questions and all the narrative in the quest for purpose are there. But I just want to cover sort of the beginning part of the book or as much as we can in this show time that we have uh, to get you to start thinking about, you know, why is it that so many people uh, struggle with purpose? Well, we believe in a couple of concepts that many of the other writers don't. And that is, there's this concept of meaning before purpose. So you, this, this whole question around spirituality and who I am, and I know some of the other authors just, they just sort of went over it, said it's not important, and I disagree. I believe it's critically important, and I'll talk about that a little bit further. But I'm also going to talk about some of the framework that we have in the course in the book and now the journal to help you go to the next level. Now, before we get there, you know, my story is I grew up on a dairy farm. So I'm the firstborn male of Eastern European descent. So how much pressure do you think it was for me to stay on the farm? Like a little bit, right? And so after I came back from agricultural college, and then I was working with my dad, uh, it came pretty clear that both of us wanted to be in charge. It wasn't really an environment where your opinion was welcomed, or there was this collaboration. Now, what happened was it seemed to be all or nothing. You know, if I was to be intense and then sort of demand my own way, so, uh, dad would say, fine, go do it. And then, of course, there might be some decisions that are wrong on my part, but I'm 21, 22 years of age. Uh, and part of the problem was we hadn't really learned how to communicate with one another. And the European background is, is that, you know, I, I only give you feedback when you screw up. And to say that you did something well or to compliment you would to make – would really contribute to your head exploding. So we wouldn't want you to get too full of yourself. So let's not do that encouragement side. So that was really the environment. And I don't blame my dad. I love him. I mean, he, he, when I record this, he's 88 and still alive and maybe not when you listen to this. But he was doing the best that he could because that's how he was taught. And so he didn't know any different. And so I don't hold it him against him uh, whatsoever. But I knew very early on when I was uh, 16 years of age that I wanted to be a speaker. And so I was involved with speaking competitions in 4-H. I was asked to be MC of many groups in the city uh, as an MC uh, when I was 17, 18, 19, and enjoyed that immensely. Uh, and when I did a, a presentation in Toronto, Canada, uh, when I, on my 16th birthday to the sponsors of the 4-H movement, many of these being CEOs of billion-dollar banks, I just absolutely loved it. Now, I didn't do formal speaking to start with, uh, but I knew that it was something that I was heading to. So one of the questions I have for you is that, you know, the rally and the stats are, are dismal. Less than 10% or around 10% of the population are living a life on purpose. That means that of all the listeners, you are in the zone. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You, it's your assignment. It's your calling. It's your purpose. It energizes you. The majority of the world is not engaged at work or in life. Well, that is the saddest state of affairs. Now, you need to be doing what you love to do and what you enjoy doing, not from a self-centered point of view, but from a self-honoring point of view, where you get to tap into this innate motivation. It's not motivation, but it's inspiration, because that motivation is a myth. Nobody can motivate you. Nobody can motivate me. And if I have a lot of procrastination in my life, we actually say that this is a sign. I'm either doing the wrong things or I'm doing the right things in the wrong environment or both. So if I'm actually, if I'm speaking as I'm doing right now, this is not hard work for me. Uh, yes, I need to prep. I need to think about it. But this is something I could do day in and day out and feel energized for it, by it. Now, I appreciate a live audience, a live group to interact with, um, and that is not something I've been doing recently, obviously, but as a result of that, I still like to communicate and to encourage. So my purpose is to help others to live, lead, and work on purpose, and to help you realize your potential. So all of us have sort of a journey. So my encouragement to you and no matter where you're at, is that your purpose in life is to live your purpose. And if you don't know what your purpose is, then your purpose is to find your purpose. I left the farm um, just three, I think it was two or three years after coming back from ag college. I just couldn't work with my father. 
it wasn't something that was uh, going to end well. We were all uh, getting angry with each other all the time, so so be it. But I eventually, a few years later, started my own dairy farm across the street, and I rented a facility, and I was actually in a sales position at that time, and I was doing both. And I got up one morning, and some of you have heard this story before, but this is really for you as well. I got up one morning, and I says, listen, sun is coming up, 5.30, 6 a.m. in the morning, and I said to myself, if I was standing here in this exact spot 20 years from now doing this exact profession of being a dairy farmer, would that be okay? And I said, my heart said, absolutely not. Now, I enjoyed it and it was okay, but it wasn't really this passion or this place that I wanted to contribute. So I made it that, uh, that decision at that moment. I said, well, what is it going to be then? And then I transitioned and bought a sales training franchise because sales is where I was in as a profession at that time and then grew my expertise uh, in information and authorship from that point and uh, proceeded to sell the dairy farm. But it was not easy because that was not only, I mean, obviously I couldn't work with my dad, which was one thing, but then the inability not the inability, just the lack of desire to stay there was pretty clear. And that's true for everybody else. Now, the other thing that happens is there's so much pressure by outside sources to many of us to go down certain pathways. You know that 50% of the global population workforce now is contract. So this idea of a career is even a misnomer. So you have expertise that you have to bring to the marketplace. So you're not following a career path, you're following expertise, passion, and purpose, which could lead into a career for a short period of time or not. So if my purpose is to help others to live, lead, and work on purpose, and I started by doing live training seminars and developing it, and then all of a sudden I'm doing virtual seminars or online courses or developing assessments and move from a speaker who is doing writing to an author who speaks, that is a progression of that same form. And we're going to come into what I call the quest beliefs in today's show, which will be quite interesting for many people. The other pressure that happens is society has this sort of pathway. They think that everybody should go down. Now, I'm not anti-education, but about 70% of North American parents, now I can't speak for the rest of the world, want their children to go to university and take sort of a, a vanilla garden variety bachelor of arts degree which for the most point is the least employable and the reality is is that most young people don't even have the reflective part of their brain working until they're 19 years of age and why and who says that you need to go to education or go to university now which in the US or Canada will cost you a hundred to four hundred thousand dollars and sink you in debt for the rest of your life is why is that and it was interesting because there was a study done of parents that said, what percentage of parents want their kids to go to trade school? And in North America, it was 2%. So I don't want you to be a plumber. I don't want you to be um, a carpenter. I don't want you to be an electrician. I don't want you to be a crane operator or heavy equipment operator. Uh, but yet, those are some of the highest paying jobs in the world right now. The other thing that was uh, stunning, there was a new research project that came out in Canada w just at the time of me recording this. And it was interesting is that, and this is not a slight on this profession, and, and don't take this the wrong way, but the research project showed that meeting with career counselors in high school and university had negative effect on career clarity. Now, nobody went through and said, why is that? I have a certain amount of guesses on that, and that's why I'm doing this show. And the reason is, is that people, kids especially, should not be looking for careers in university, except, especially that first or second year, and especially in high school. They should be looking for what energizes them. They should be looking for what interests them. And out of those will percolate and become clear what careers might be possible. And so it's showing in this research study that by interacting with counselors, it actually lowered their improving their career clarity. 
So that means I think it's not the heart of the counselors. Don't get me wrong. It's the methodology. It's the expectation. It's the intent. I think we've got it wrong. We've actually trying to get people to make decisions when they're not ready. You know, you don't go today and decide to do a marathon and uh, today and then go run it tomorrow. You have not prepped. You're not ready. You haven't trained. And so I think for individuals, a lot of times people discover what they want to do by finding out what they don't want to do. They go through the back door. And so that's another consideration as well. And the sad part is there is some research you know, I, when I was speaking in Singapore a few years ago, it's one of the fifth or sixth highest GDPs in the world, is that over 90% of the people disliked their job or were miserable, and maybe the word miserable is strong, but they, weren't, they were unhappy. And so it's clear that money doesn't make you happy. Yes, you need the monetary means by which to uh, house yourself and transportation and food, but after that, you need to be doing what? excites you, what energizes you. So one of the concepts that I've been talking about on many shows is this idea of self-awareness. And that self-awareness is foundational to our sustainability. And if I'm not aware that I'm not aware that I'm not aware, how can I make any kind of intentional decisions that lead my life? Well, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of having Tra Tasha, Dr. Tasha Urich, who wrote the book Insight, on my show and so you can go back to that episode and in her book she said what percentage of people believe that they know themselves and a staggering 95 percent of people said yes i am conscious awake and aware and how and who i am is congruent with and equal to how other people experience me or their opinions of me and then she sent her students out and said what percentage of those out there believe what I think about myself to be the same. In other words, your opinion of self is congruent with how other people experience you. You know what was a measly 10% where that was the same? That means 85% of people are not aware that they're not aware that they're not aware. Their opinion of self is not congruent with how other people see them, experience them. So one of the number one responsibilities for you, the listener, if you really want to become in do in experience life at the highest level it's your responsibility to go down this 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 place of self-awareness very deep and intentional and purposeful and we'll cover that here in a minute so the reality is if 85 percent of people are delusional that they don't know they don't know is that then they're not going to change anything they're not even aware they're not aware so we want to create this awareness with mindfulness this emotional intelligence all these things increase those so I can make intentional decisions. And then there's these other things where, you know, cultural norms have expectations and drive people to go down, well, you know what? Uh, you need to be a doctor. I, in fact, I was actually on a Zoom call with my friend who I coached, uh, I'll say colleague, 15 years ago, who is an MD, who really didn't like the profession. And I said, what are you doing being a doctor? All the years of training, he said, well, this is what my dad always wanted for me. And so really he shifted that, and now he supports MDs with their wellness and burnout and those elements. And so he really did a shift, has credibility with his marketplace because he's, he's serving doctors, and he is a doctor, but he's not being a doctor. He's being a health professional in support mechanism so that people – so that his – professionals, his peers, really have a fulfilling life versus being burnt out. The other thing that came in this whole mix is that many of you are familiar with Brendan Bouchard, and he wrote the book High Performance Habits. And he had six habits in the book, but the number one habit of high performers is clarity. So are you clear about where you're going and what's happening? So when I did this all this work around career development, I had a chance to have lunch with the late uh, Richard or Dick Bowles, who wrote the best-selling book, What Color Is Your Parachute? And I asked him at dinner in California, I said, you know, Richard, with all this career development and books and everything that's out there, why do we still have so many people confused, so many people uncertain, so many people who don't know what to do in their life? And his response is, is that people have not been willing to do the work. You know what? You are not going to have a microwave life, is that you're in this thing for the whole, on, full on, and so taking the time to be reflective, to do the journaling, 
to do the assessments, to ask the questions, to hire a coach, to invest in yourself so that you can get clear is this is not something you do in an afternoon or a 30 minute podcast. This is a start, but it's certainly not the end. And I invested in my own coach, Mike McManus, and he took me through a, a process, which is, I built on that process in the quest for purpose. Mike passed away many years ago from cancer. And as a result of that, I got clear about, I knew I was supposed to be a speaker, but I didn't know about what to who. So I spent six months working with him as a coach in 1989, 1990, when coaching wasn't big. That was transformational for me. So my question for you today is, are you living on purpose? Are you? And if you're not, what are you going to do about it? And if you are on purpose, then what can you do to help others to live on purpose? Maybe give them this podcast, forward it to them. Maybe our course, The Quest for Purpose any uh, amount of those different items. Now, many of the books out there don't talk about meaning before purpose. So I just want to briefly talk about two or three other concepts that I want to put in front of clarifying your purpose. And one of those is, and I have, we covered in the book, is this whole idea about character. Character are choices. Character is how you choose to live your life. Character is conditions and situations and choices of responsibility so that you can live a fulfilling life <clears throat> on purpose. And I'm just going to cover a few that we, I have on the list that's in the book. So number one is living a life uh, with forgiveness. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, there's no way you're going to be happy. There's no way that you're going to feel fulfilled. We know that unforgiveness is toxic to the body. It erodes the soul. It causes immunity to go down. You're going to be sick more. You're going to be belligerent more. You're going to be irritated more. And so you don't forgive others, no matter what the situation is and how horrific it was for them. You forgive them for you. Because if I don't forgive them, then you've heard me say this before. It's like you giving them the poison or you taking the poison and expecting the other person to die. So unforgiveness is poison is in your system. So no matter, even if the person is gone and you don't have a relationship with them, you have a choice at this very moment to be in forgiveness towards them. I'm not saying it's easy. And those, those of us that have sort of a spiritual underpinning, we know that in some cases we've been forgiven for our stuff through that relationship and that allows us to forgive others even though in I'll call it in the natural in the world in the humanistic world it's not something you want to do or it's easy uh, because an offended heart really is not very functional it's dysfunctional one of the other character traits is this whole concept of integrity you know the word corruption is filtering through the world at all levels if it's political if it's news if it's uh, organizations, if it's uh, industries, all, all of us want to be able to deal with somebody with integrity. But now we have suspect. We're, we're wondering, can I trust you? Is that information real? What is, what isn't? It's so mired, it's so confusing, you don't even know what's real and what's not. But one of the things that you can do, no matter what, is live your life in integrity. I remember doing some work and for many years we were the sole source provider of training for Chrysler Canada on the soft skills side and we developed and I think it was over 40 programs uh, for them over an eight or nine year period of time uh, co-developed with uh, partner Gordon Cameron and one of the things that happened is I remember interviewing an individual and I was working in a dealership and the person said that honesty or integrity was very important to him. And then I watched as he interacted with the customer around a used car and he wasn't really forthcoming with all, he didn't lie, but he wasn't forthcoming with all the information about the car. So I called him on it after the client left. And he says, you told me that honesty and integrity was important. And he says, yeah. And I said, but why didn't you say the, everything, the details of the car? I said, yeah, but if I shared those details, my used car manager might have fired me. And so he valued job security more than integrity. And what I called him on, I said, so what you're saying is your integrity is for sale. 
is that I can buy your integrity. So just name the number and you'll be dishonest on your behalf. I know it was harsh, but it was the reality. Now, if he chose that he doesn't want to operate in integrity, that's his choice. But don't say you are and then don't do it. The other one around, you know, living a life on purpose is this whole character trait of gratefulness and thankfulness. There's all kinds of research, no matter what's going on, is what is it that you can be thankful for? What is it that you can show gratitude for? You know, start with anything. Oh, my little pinky works. You know, I can even have a conversation. My voice works. Is start with what you do have, not what you don't have. And uh, there was a research study done and said, what were the characteristics or qualities of the people that had the most meaning but well-being in life? And gratitude and thankfulness was one of those three characteristics. So just be aware of that. Link that into your sort of your genre and be aware that, you know, just being thankful. What can you even stop right now? You know, as you're listening to this, what, what's one thing that you can be thankful for or you have gratitude towards? And there was a research study done that was over 50 years. And it said, what were some of the characteristics and strategies of these people that had the longevity? It was a study about longevity over a 50-year period of time. And what caused people to live the longest? And interesting enough is that those people that had gratitude and generosity were one of the anchor points for people living longer. So obviously long life comes into play, not only a better life, but a longer life because you show thankfulness and gratitude. A couple other items just mentioned, you know, the level of learning. You know, nowadays it's just so fast. Just keep expanding, keep growing. Um, keep getting more new information. I'm not talking about the news. I'm talking about growth. I'm talking about what skill you could learn. Uh, what um, additional insight can you have on a software that you're using at work or other, maybe you want to read about a new, your hobby uh, that around model trains or motorcycles or whatever it is. So that will help you to grow. Uh, you know, who you're hanging out with. We, you've heard that many times is that the power of association is no matter if, even if you know your purpose and then you hang around a, a bunch of individuals who are turkeys instead of eagles. And this is not a judgment towards them is that if they're going in a different direction, if they're not trying to become sort of where you're the direction that you're heading in, they're, they're going to hold you back. It's not that you're better than them. It's just that you're different than them. So think about it. Who are you associating with? You know, the research shows is that your life will best reflect the five closest friends that you have. And so if it's time for an upgrade, it's time for an upgrade or a change or a shift. Again, you're not better than them. You're simply different and you're going in that direction and they can live their own life, but allow yourself permission to have the association with those that will drag you up or pull you up or inspire you up, whatever verb you want to use. The other one that is in here around character is if you're gonna blaze a trail if you're going to go your own route, the reality is, is that you can't worry about what others say or think about me. Is there's a saying, your opinion of me is none of my business. And I'm not talking about that from a leadership point of view or supervisory feedback about how you treat your staff. I'm talking about you're making the decision, decision to go in a different uh, path on life. So when I decided to leave my sales job, to start my own sales training company, my family thought I was crazy. Why would I live a, leave a job that has a company car and my lunches are paid for? You know, what else could a person want? And so be very careful about who you share uh, this with. So those are some character traits to think about. The other one is we do believe that if you're on purpose, that you want to play to your strength. I believe that you're perfectly created for the assignments and roles you are to fulfill. Now, this doesn't mean that your life will always be as easy. It doesn't mean that you don't have skills, competencies, capabilities to develop. It just means that you're going and you're playing to your strengths. Rather than trying to develop your weaknesses, I will, unless some kind of miracle I got hit in the head with a sledgehammer, is that I don't ever see that I will be an auditor in some kind of financial statements that they're not going to be right. I'm never going to be an airplane mechanic. Those things just don't make the cut. It's just attention to the minute details. A finishing carpenter? No. Framer? Probably okay. Finishing carpenter? No. I know that. 
So I want to play to my strengths and then I want to hire the people beside me that complement who I am. The same thing with you. So is the majority of your effort, your work, your life reflecting your strengths? So there were a couple other books that were written, you know, talking about, you know, finding your element or passion. Uh, and it was interesting. They never really talked about meaning before purpose. And I just want to spend uh, probably about 15 more minutes on this show. We'll see how far we get. And then maybe we'll do part two uh, so that we have part one and part two that really take you through so that you can have the time to think about your purpose. You know, meaning is really your belief system. What do you believe highly influences what you will do or what you will not do? Even if you say you believe in nothing, that is your belief system. It is impossible as a human being to not have a belief system since, since what some call nothing is in fact something. I was actually reading my own quote. So the, the reality is, is your belief system. So some people call that spirituality, but really you are underpinning about life. Do you, is there more going on than who I am and what's important here? Is, or are we just accidents and it's just uh, an explosion that occurred? Well, we'll honor you on your choices, but your choices have implications. Your choices have impact. If you believe that there's more going on and that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience, and that there is divine um, sort of authority or presence, then that is going to change what you think. So the reality is, is that where do we get meaning from? Is uh, meaning, in most cases, comes from another source. So what gives meaning to something? Well, meaning is given by a source that, so uh, Meaning, so if somebody feels that they love you, that the meaning comes from the other person loving you. So you can love yourself, that's true, but it comes from that other person. Now, says, well, that's easy for you to say, Ken, you have, it's just been straightforward for you. Well, that's actually not true. In my late teens, I mean, I had very, very low esteem in high school. Uh, you know, I struggled with depression at different times and never really talked about it. And of course, back then, nobody talked about it. It was just that sort of poo-poo. When I went to college, I had good friends. I enjoyed college, but it was my self-worth was tenuous at best, uh, meaning situational and it could, it was fragile, I guess is the word. Uh, and, and I didn't appear to it. Of course, you don't ever want to say that to somebody else because I was looking externally for validation. So if you don't ever get validation as a kid growing up in your home and you're never good enough, then you have these sort of doubts. So I came home from college and uh, I think it was 1920. I can't actually remember when, but I, I just, because I started um, college when I was 17 and it was just a two year uh, sort of technical degree or diploma that I got. And so at 1920, 21, I just, I was done with life. I said, that's it. I am, um, I don't want to be here. So I sat in the chair, I still remember this, with a loaded uh, gun. And I said, you know what? Let's, let's just end the misery. Now, most people know, those people who have suicidal thoughts, try to reach out, try to have meaning. They don't want to do it, but they are now in this state of hopelessness. And so as a result of that, I obviously didn't. <laughs> and I went on a journey for about 10 years of really trying to find meaning in that, you know, meaning comes from somewhere. Now, my friend, Dr. Andy Steiger, was kind enough to endorse my book, The Quest for Purpose. But he also wrote the book, Thinking, Answering Life, Life's Five Biggest Questions. Now, this comes out of his book. And this is, I'm just going to leave this with you. And if you want to find out about his book, Thinking by Dr. Andy Steiger, okay, you can go to Apologetics Canada is uh, dot, I think it's dot CA. Let's just confirm dot com, pardon me. And you can find out about his book. But here's the five questions. And what Dr. Andy did, he went into coffee shops and he was just listening to people and said, what, what were these questions that were these deep sort of meaning questions that people were asking about that was way before this concept of career. 
or way before even uh, purpose is that I want to get this belief system kind of anchored first. So the, the first question that most people kind of on the list was what is the meaning of life? So I'm not trying to answer them for you. It's just that these are the questions that people, I encourage that they need to clarify in that clarifying and having an answer to these questions will lead to something, meaning the outcome has impact in your life. So the next question is, does God exist? So if there is or there isn't, this has, you know, capital G, not small g, this has impact on you and your belief system in, you know, is there some assistance out there or am I out there out here on my own? And then if God exists, do all religions lead to God? And so what does that mean? And can uh, these different belief systems coexist? And so Andy, Andy answers that in his book. The next question, you know, people says, well, if there's a God, why is there so much evil? Why is there evil? You see that where uh, just recently heard about over 100 pastors in Africa being beheaded uh, just before me taping the show, meaning in the last month or so. So, you know, where does that come from? That's evil for sure. And of course, another question that people ask is, is there life after death? Now, you say, Ken, what the heck has got this got to do with a career, with purpose? Well, everything. It's your underpinning. It's your belief system. It will cause what you do and what you don't do and what's most important to you. So I have a whole series of other comments around what I call the quest beliefs. And I'm not going to do that today in this show. I'm just going to leave that and do a part two. And so in the next, in part two around purpose, I'm going to go deeper into the book, but I'm going to send, I'm going to share with you what I call the quest beliefs. Now let me share the first one with you so that you will come back to show number two uh, when it's released. And that is this whole concept of motivation. You know, motivation is a myth. Nobody can motivate you. I mentioned this earlier. Interests require no motivation. So, so suppose as a listener, you're a golfer and it's a beautiful day. It's 70 some degrees or 20 something outside in Celsius. Uh, you have a great golf course. You have some very good friends, awesome opportunity to go out there. You don't have any other obligations. And I say, let's go golfing. Do you even have to think about it? Absolutely not if that's something that you enjoy and you love doing. So interests preclude any need for motivation. You know, when somebody the other day asked me, could I be a, a virtual speaker to their team? I didn't even think about it. Yes, it's my profession, but this is, yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to do this uh, presentation and this workshop for your team virtually. I didn't have to think about it. Now, if somebody said, Ken, could you come over and, you know, clean up all this audit books, it ain't going to happen. So I know what I like and I know what I dislike, but for you, motivation is a myth. Interests really draw us. They energize us, energize us. So here's an interesting statement. We only require motivation for those things that do not interest us. If you're interested, you don't need motivation. If it is drawing you, then why should I have to force you? Why should I have to struggle with it? Now, I'm not saying that every moment of our life is perfect. I mean, there's some days where doing the company, CRG work, Ken Keys and uh, dot com, I just say, you know what? I'm kind of, I'm, I don't have the energy today. It wasn't to do with a lack of interest. It had to do just with my overall energy and I needed a break. Hey, we all do. Even if you love golf, even the most obsessed golf, Golfer, if I said you had to play two rounds every day for the next month, I think you would be done with golf at the end, even though you love it. So uh, I guess you would say too much of a good thing. So we have a certain balance of that, but could I speak every, just about every day um, for a couple of hours to a group? Probably. I would enjoy doing it, but I want to change it up a little bit so that my voice wouldn't get raspy. So when we think about purpose, is we're starting to lay the, the groundwork for what we need to do to really feel fulfilled in the different elements that many other authors or programs 
or books don't talk about. And uh, around meaning before purpose, around character traits, uh, around belief systems that are important before we go. So, by the way, if somebody out there is feeling down, if for whatever reason um, there's this hopelessness, is my encouragement is that please get the assistance, get the help, reach out to somebody who can give you a hand up, is that every single person listening is valuable. Every single person is here for a reason. Every life is valuable. And so all lives are important, and yours especially. And so I, and, and I didn't always believe that about myself, and it's not about self-centeredness. It's not about arrogance. About, this is really about self-honoring so that you can stand in this space of confidence, and then when people see that confidence, you, you, you really pass that on to others and said, oh, I really can see working with Ken. He's a confident individual. He's not arrogant where he thinks he's better than somebody else. But that confidence is what you can bring into life where you'll make decisions, sometimes difficult ones, to leave a career that you've trained for, like my friend who was a doctor, to move into something completely different or different that means I did all this training, all this education, but that's not what I love and allow yourself permission to make that change. Now, as always, thank you for being a Secrets of Success listener. We'll do a part two. And, you know, pass this on, uh, share it, leave a positive comment in whatever platform you're listening on. And as we mentioned in the beginning, we have now converted uh, the Quest for Purpose into an e-course. And my hope is that we can tip what would it mean instead of 10%? We have 20% of the world's population on purpose. I think that's momentum. That's a movement. That's a place where we can change the world if we have more people enjoying life and being engaged at work and, and bringing their best self and realizing their potential. You imagine what that could be like? And you're one of those people to contribute. Whoever you are, wherever you are listening. You've been listening to Secrets of Success, and I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Thanks for exploring the Secrets of Success with us. If you want to keep the momentum going, log on to crgleader.com. Scroll to the bottom and sign up for our inspirational emails. You can also take your success to the next level by following us on Facebook and Twitter and connecting with Ken on LinkedIn. We hope you have a great week and look forward to you joining us next time for the Secrets of Success podcast with Dr. Ken Keyes.